Hello world! My name is Ben and welcome to the first episode of Recap. I've been running a Dungeons & Dragons game for quite a while, with the current campaign having started in 2011. In order for me to provide you with post-game updates that make sense, I'm going to have to catch you up. Hopefully covering the last three years of game doesn't take too much time. So the game is set in a world of my own creation called Portrandi, which in the local ancient vernacular translates to Gateway to Divinity. Players explored that theme last time when their characters eventually ascended to godhood, but this time they started out as slaves. For one reason or another, Varga, Relvin, Delror, Kug, and Klarn all ended up as slaves in a small town called Markat, in a region of the kingdom of Azim known as the Holy Armpit. Varga is a female orc fighter of considerable size. She wields a morning star, but really isn't very bright. Relvin is an eventy male, and he's your typical sword and board, full plate kind of fighter. Belroar is a gnome necromancer. Kug is a bugbear fighter, specializing in using shield and morning star. Klarn is a Dermu druid. The big problem, other than slavery, with this town was that it bordered the kingdom of Gob, a goblet infested forest that was constantly raiding Azim. On one of those raids, the goblins took most of the town's slaves as booty. So the party found themselves in goblin hands. Luckily for them, the chief shaman of the Hawk clan, a putrid old goblin named Glux, recognizes an energy about these five slaves and decides to make them members of a group called the Elementals, who are chosen servants of Balm, the primal god of the elements. Each of the characters is attuned to one particular element or para-element. Relvin is ice, Kug is fire, Varga is air, Klarn is water, Belroar is earth. This frees them from slavery. Not long afterwards, the goblin village is wiped out by a retribution attack from Markat. At the time, the party was off investigating a beach landing they'd seen nearby while out getting supplies. The next night, the party and another surviving member of the Elementals, a goblin named Berth, Berth is Ooze, are camping when the god Balm appears to them over the fire. He identifies them as his servants and tells them to seek out gateways as a means to grow in power, the closest one being at the Lost Tower back in Azim. Heeding the word of a god, they go to the Lost Tower and find it overcome by ice due to a gateway to the para-elemental plane of ice that opened on top of the tower. They cleared the tower, killed the gateway's guardian, Mephit, and collected a chunk of primal ice left from the collapsed gateway. After the tower, the party stops in at Marcotte for some stealthy recon, a pit stop on their way to find Captain Pantaloon, an infamous slave trader, heard to sail out of the city of Tidebreach. When they get to Tidebreach, the party is offered a modest cash reward and five magic beans in return for helping to free a family from brigands that have taken the family hostage. The party, with the idea that they can buy off their slavery so they would no longer be fugitives, take up the opportunity to gain some platinum. So the party succeeds in their quest and is rewarded. Taking the new wealth, they head back to Marcotte to pay off their debts to become free. But on the way, they run into Ash Splitbow. He was another Marcotte slave from back in the day and his band of Anarchs that are trying to start a movement. One of their number, an elf named Tilda Buttercup, she was a love interest of Relvin's in the Marcot slave group, has been taken prisoner. So the party takes the law into their own hands, thinking that they can no longer just buy their freedom. And they assault Marcot, liberating the slaves and decimating the guard. The next morning, the Azimar Paladin teleports to Marcot to confront the Anarchs in the town, obviously an individual powerhouse, capable of slaying everyone in town if he chose, Paladin took charge. He established a trial for the officials in Marcotte that were making wealth off the slave trade. The trial concluded with the executions of the corrupt officials and the Paladin mentoring the Anarchs in how to go about overthrowing the slave trade in the Holy Armpit. As the party left Marcotte again, Clarn decided to head off on his own to check in on his family and return to the Icelands of the South. However, Zinj joined the party, having seen their elemental ways and having helped them in the liberation of Marcotte. Zinj is a male skulk, half barbarian, half thief, and is really sneaky with his great axe. Zinj is smoke. The party next goes to the Obelisk, a nearby tower that can see much of the Holy Armpit and would make a good home base for the Anarchs. They rid the Obelisk of monsters that are infesting it. And then the party and the Anarchs started an assault on nearby work camps where slaves were forced to do logging. After the three camps were burned down and the slaves freed, the kingdom soldiers were found to be on high alert so it was time for the Anarchs to lie low. At this point, the servants of Baum learned that they could focus their senses and sense distant planar gateways, giving them a way of tracking their god-given goals. Kug was able to sense a fire gateway in the sky to the northwest, 
And so the party left the Anarch movement in search of power. It turned out that the fire gateway was on top of a mountain. The party climbed up, defeated the fire denizens that had emerged, and beat down the Guardian fire method. Unfortunately, just as the method was defeated, a blast of fire struck out and knocked Relvin into the gateway. The party watched in surprise as the gateway closed with Relvin nowhere to be seen. Knowing no way to recover Relvin directly, Kug claimed the primal fire and the party decided to continue on their quest. Varga was able to sense an air gateway on the horizon to the south, so that's where they headed next. On the way there, Belroar got a magical message from the goblin Berth, saying that they needed to meet up. To which the reply was, we'll be there after we deal with this thing we're doing. So the party went on, found a cloud castle floating over a lake, and a tempest making the area quite unhospitable. But not as unhospitable as the giants in the castle that knocked out or killed Kug, Zinj, and Varga. Belroar took this opportunity to flee rather than dying himself, and abandoned the party to go meet up with Berth. It turned out that part of their primal essences allowed the downed party members to recover after a short respite. Coming back from defeat, they finished off the giants, defeated the guardian air method, sealed the air gateway, and Varga claimed the primal air left behind. Zinj was the next, sensing a smoke gateway from further south on the ocean shore. One night on the way there, the party was camping by a pond, and Relvin came in, swimming up out of it. Happy to have their compatriot back, the party continued toward the smoke gateway. The party found that the cliff island of Ledgewalford had a tunnel connecting it to the mainland under the water, and it was in that tunnel that the gateway had formed. Happy to oblige, the party cleared the tunnel, claimed the primal smoke, and were recognized by Ledgewall for their bravery and aid. Ledgewall was having particularly bad luck, it seemed, because they also had a magma gateway open in the copper mines below the town. This had attracted Gurgen, who teamed up with the party and once again saved the town. Gurgen is a dwarven war priest. Gurgen is magma, with Gurgen claiming the primal magma dropped by the closing gateway. After this rescue of the town, the party found that an airship, the Barry May, had arrived while the party was in the mines. Airships are rare and tend to be temples to Jack, the god of fate and destiny, which are really just like floating casinos. On the airship, the party had a strange encounter with Captain Bree and found themselves having visions of battles with elementals and giants and dragons and growing in power. They knew immediately that this was another message from Balm. The first step of this new quest was to gather the necessary ritual components which the party decided they could get in a nearby coastal city of Woodnest. Unfortunately, Woodnest was having problems with a were dragon that was demanding the sacrifice of children, but fortunately the party was there to help. There was a lot of chaos the night the dragon and his minions actually attacked Woodnest, but the party saved many people and took on the were dragon. They held its attention long enough for a local dragon slayer to catch up, wielding a magical sword, which the slayer used to dispatch the beast. In exchange for their aid, the party was given wealth and obtained the ritual components they had come for. The next step was to find a powerful wizard that could summon the elementals needed for the first round of cleansing rituals. This was on the island of Brynmore, deep in a sepulcher, where the summoner Venel resided away from people. Nothing ever being easy, it turned out that Venel had lost control of a demon that he had summoned, which led the thing to taking over the crypt, raising the dead as minions, and starting a small army. The party had great difficulty, some members dying a couple of times in the process, but they were able to work their way to the lowest chambers, dispatching the demon and saving Venel. In exchange for their aid, Venel happily summoned the elementals for the party to engage in ritual combat. Just before leaving Bryn Mawr, Melanoa arrived on the island, also seeking Venel's help. Turned out she was also a chosen of Balm, and so she joined up with the party. Melanoa is an Aventi wizard, specializing in conjuring. Melanoa is water. Moving on from this, the party knew that they needed to find a powerful elemental giant that they could fight in another ritual combat. They learned of King Helizod Thunderstrike, a storm giant that ruled over a castle on an island who was known for taking slaves and raping women and who fit the bill for their next challenge. The party enlisted the help of Chief Freyus in Ledgewall to assault the castle and slay the king. It turned out Freyus was actually King Thunderstrike's bastard child. The party succeeded in raiding the castle and defeating the king, but something bad happened. During exploration of the castle, the party found dragon bones stitched together and marked with runes. When the king fell, the dragon absorbed the storm giant's essence and became a storm dragon. Filled with rage and confusion in its new birth, the storm dragon toppled the castle, killing everyone on the island, the party included. Luckily, the party found themselves once again coming back to life, though they were succumbing to a primal true form and losing their personalities. The storm dragon had risen up and become a force to be reckoned with. It flew north and raised the city of Woodnest, along with several other towns. Based on information the party was able to gather, 
This dragon was going to be their next ritual combat challenge, but was growing stronger and seemed to be absorbing the energies of the towns it was destroying. It seemed to be a creature of positive energy, and it was surmised that the only effective way to get through its resistance to damage was to use weapons infused with negative energy. Those weapons are extremely rare, but the party set out on a quest to find enough of them to equip themselves. The first weapon Zinj had already found in Venal's Sepulchre. The next closest was the blade of an infamous assassin, which Divination indicated was in a green dragon's horde. The party tracked down the dragon's lair, Varga almost single-handedly killed it, and they recovered the magical blade. One major problem with these negative energy-infused weapons was that they aren't very pleasant for living beings to hold, particularly to non-evil living beings. To counter this, the party needed to claim the Necrobane armor and learn to duplicate its positive energy effect. That armor and the next weapon were both in the Dwarven Keep of Sandbreak, on the east side of the Great Desert. The party traveled there and found it to be a hub and training ground for the Radiant Servants of Jeringan, the God of the Sun. Amazingly, the party went the diplomatic route and overcame some battle challenges to prove that they could protect the armor and weapon from falling into the wrong hands if the artifacts were loaned to the party. The party not only gained the two items, they also gained the Brownbone Clan of Dwarves and the Servants of Jeringan as allies in fighting the Storm Dragon. The next weapon on the party's list was a Morning Star that belonged to a fallen angel. It was on display over a fireplace in a tavern called the Sea's Last Hope, in the port town of Cloudfall between the Eastern Mountains and the Mountains of Tears. After some research, the party was able to teleport to Cloudfall rather than having to travel on foot or boat halfway across the world through very hostile territory. It turned out that a Celestial Archon and four Celestial Evangels guarded the Morning Star so that it would never fall into the wrong hands. Varga, having no common sense, was able to resist all the mental and physical blockades, picked up the weapon, and convinced the Celestials that being able to pick it up meant divine permission for that to be the case. In an odd turn of events, Celestials left, and the party was given the weapon. Okay, so that's where things stand currently. The party is still going on to claim at least one more weapon, Great Axe supposedly located in the Necropolis of Blood Hall, in a land ruled by Death Giants. But we'll go over that as the game sessions continue. I know I went over a lot and skipped a number of details and twists that probably leave you wondering, what? How? So let me know in the comments below if there's something specific you want addressed, and I'll see about answering it in a future installment of Recap. Remember, subscribe if you want to see more of my videos, and give this video a thumbs up if you want to see more like this one. Thanks for watching, and have a fantastic day. Bugbears are naturally stealthy.